bedazzled. This is the city. The city of Absalom. The city at the center of the world. Absalom is celebrating the Radiant Festival, a three-month festival of epic proportions held once every hundred years. The celebration attracts all types. Tourists, performers, merchants, inventors, as well as unsavory types, petty thieves, gangs, cults, and criminal enterprises. That's where we come in. We protect and serve. We are the agents of Edgewatch. Absalon, the city at the center of the world, has always drawn travelers from distant lands. Yet, this year is different, for it is the year of the Radiant Festival, a celebration of epic proportions held every hundred years to commemorate the failed Radiant Siege of Absalon in 1619 AR. Delegations from across the world congregate at Epsilon's fairgrounds to exhibit their nation's marvels of magic and masonry. A cavalcade of performers, merchants, and inventors flood into the city to astound tourists with their art and ingenuity. This year's grand exhibits include incredible gyroscopic towers from Vuder, a Minkarian kin temple called the Dragonfly Pagonia, a moving castle built by Kesselsite engineers, and a terrifyingly massive excavation machine called the Grave Raker. While the failed siege by the Whispering Tyrant a year ago set the festival behind schedule and threatened to undo all the hard work of the festival's committee, Tarbafon's defeat has given the Absalonians all the more reason to celebrate, and the fair is poised to open to great fanfare, even with many of the exhibits only half completed. Already the city groans under the pressure of thousands of tourists, with locals simultaneously thrilled at the flow of trade and despairing at the overcrowding. To alleviate the latter, Absalon's leaders have adapted an ambitious plan. The prominent Absalonian architect Bloon Bandersworth, with the support of the Grand Council member and the city planner Olena Tremor, propositioned the Grand Council and bid for a contract to magically transform the Precipice Quarter a district all but destroyed in an earthquake 22 years ago, into the heart of the 4720 AR Resident Festival. The enthusiasm of acting Primarch Winsel Starborn, who since taking his station has wanted to resurrect the Precipice Quarter, sealed the deal for the site of this century's Grand Fair. The Radiant Festival has already brought gold and tourists to the city like never before, but with such an opportunity comes danger. Unable to completely clear the precipice quarter of monstrous threats before the opening day festivities, festival officials have simply corridored off some parts of the district. To keep the peace, Absalon's leaders have established a new division of guards to patrol the quarter during the fair and thereafter. The Edge Watch. The four of you all heard several months ago that the city of Absalon was looking to start a new city watch centered around guarding the Radiant Festival and the many tourists expecting to flood the city. After the recent attack on the city by Tarbafon, you felt like you wanted to help out in some way. So you signed up to be a member of this new division of City Guard and started your training right away. Over the past few weeks, the training has been hard, but rewarding, with the majority of your training centered around non-violent means of diffusing difficult situations and how to perform an astonishingly large number of non-lethal attacks. You've not had much time to talk with the other recruits, as not only has the coursework kept you busy, but as soon as you got to know someone, 
they were gone. A stunning number of recruits washed out of the program at a surprising pace. It appears that the Edge Watch is serious in taking on those interested in upholding the law and protecting citizens. Anyone showing even the slightest wavering in those ideals is quickly shown the door and never seen again. After weeks of training, the initial group of several thousand recruits has been whittled down to perhaps a hundred or less. But after weeks and weeks of hard work, you finally made it to the final day, graduation day. You wake up at first light to form lines in the general courtyard for today is the day before the first day of summer and the day before the start of the Radiant Festival. You quickly get out of your bunk, get dressed, and join the ranks of your fellow recruits, seeing a wide variety of people from all around Galarian. You look around the courtyard and everyone is formed into neat lines, facing an elevated platform. Standing on the platform, you see an enormous human man who could have easily towered over this crowd without the platform. He's a massive figure, broad shoulder with brown hair, streaked with gray and a bushy mustache, wearing shining breastplate armor with the edge watch symbol emblazoned on the chest in gold. You've heard stories about Lieutenant Grosbeck Levarius, or rather... You have heard his astonishingly loud voice bellowing throughout the guardhouse at all hours. Flanking the lieutenant, you also notice Sergeant Olo, a male dwarf, and Corporal Kerr Bastille, a female human, along with several officers of the watch. The lieutenant begins to speak, with his thunderous voice overpowering all others. Welcome to your graduation day. You have all made it through the rigorous training to become members of the newest division of Absalon's Watch, the Edge Watch. Your primary duty will be to provide security for the high-profile Radiant Festival, as well as the Precipice Quarter, which has lacked a proper district watch for more than 20 years. Because of the unusual circumstances regarding your trading and recruitment, we have taken several new steps during the creation of the Edge Watch. First, you have all been religiously screened, interviewed, detected, and background checked to make sure all of you are upstanding citizens and truly on the side of the law. Hence, everyone assigned to the Watch should be of the highest character and we expect you to do your job with the utmost dignity. Second, during your stay in the watch, the city will pay for your food, training, uniforms, and lodging in the station barracks. Hopefully it'll allow you to focus on your job and only your job as your creature comforts will be taken care of by the watch. And finally, you will all be assigned a personal lawbreaker badge which will practically do your job for you. This is a brand new piece of magic that was developed by the most powerful sages in all of Absalon. Each Lawbreaker badge will be attuned to you and you alone, meaning don't lose them. Similar in design to a Pathfinder Wayfinder, your Lawbreaker badge will act as your ears and your eyes to help you perform your duties. Although all of you have been trained in the means of non-lethal combat, the Lawbreaker Badge will automatically convert many of your spells and attacks into less deadly versions of what you normally would perform. Hence, if you want to cast a Fireball to break up a fight, feel free! The Lawbreaker Badge will keep the power and intensity of the Fireball spell, but merely knock those out so they can be arrested and brought to justice. Suddenly, the corporal interrupts the lieutenant. Do note, when facing horrors and monstrosities, such as the undead or aberrations, you will have the power to turn off the non-lethal mode. Just make sure you do this when you're absolutely sure that level of force is necessary. The lieutenant waits a bit to make sure the corporal is finished, and then continues. The badge will also provide you an overview of the punishment any lawbreaker must abide by. 
Most times, lawbreakers will simply need to pay a fine or forfeit their weapons and armor in violent cases. The Lawbreaker Badge will help you dispense justice without you being the one personally responsible for the judgment. Finally, you can use the Lawbreaker Badge to heal yourself in times of crisis. Once per day, you can cast the champion equivalent of Lay on Hands. So make sure you only use that in the most dire of emergency. Oh yes, and one more thing. Accepting the Lawbreaker Badge will be the same as swearing your oath to uphold the law and provide a beaming example to all members of Absalon Society. Which means that yes, the Badge will be keeping tabs on you. Always. And report any malfeasance to me. So make sure you follow the law or you'll end up in the stockades. The lieutenant takes a small break and continues. As you all know, the Radiant Festival starts tomorrow and lasts for three months. It will be a hard three months with thousands of new faces streaming into the city. But I'm sure Edgewatch will go down as the smoothest and most successful launch of a new city watch in the history of Absalon. And with that, you've all completed your training and now members of the Edge Watch. I'll be calling out your names and assigning you to four person squads. Your squad will be your family for the next year. After squad assignments are complete, report back to me in one hour for your first assignment. With that, Lieutenant Lavaris starts to call out names and assignments to various squads. Johnson, Razorback, Tar, and Blort, Blue Squad. You see four recruits step forward, obviously looking over their new teammates with scrutiny. They then form a line in front of the corporal, and she pins the Lawbreaker badges onto each of their chests. Nova, Smith, Rancor, and Cho, Green Squad. Again, four recruits step forward and go through the same procedure as the first. This continues for quite some time, with various squads being called out by color. Orange. Blue, magenta, along with noticeable moans to those assigned to the brown and pink squad. Finally, you hear Gomez, McDougal, Blackfeather, Lomang, Red Squad. You walk up to the front. The corporal shakes your hand and pins the Lawbreaker badge on your chest. Immediately, you feel a strange surge of energy flow through your body. And you simply know that this badge can read your very thoughts. An uncomfortable yet reassuring feeling. You're then pushed off to the side with the other members of your squad where you can get to know each other better. Yeah, Dougie McDougal is going to try to stand in front of the corporal longer than he needs to to salute and like get as much attention as possible. See if she uh, is she impressed by uh, Corporal uh, or, or Cadet Dougie McDougal? John Stats is playing Cadet Dougie McDougal, a human something. Yes, yes. She she she, she returns your salute and uh, shoes you off because now new people are coming forward. But she doesn't really realize how much Dougie McDougal wants her to know that he's going to try his very best to serve the city. Does, does, does she look like she is going to appreciate his diligence? Yes, just as much as she appreciates everyone else's diligence, you brand new recruit with one minute of experience <laughs> on the job. In good with the corporal, huh? Yeah, well, as long as she understands. Yes, yes. And the watch officer sort of pushes you along to get out of the way because there's a, there's a quick line of other squads getting their badges as well. Can you guys believe that this is happening like it's finally actually happening this is the best day in my life so so when you when you um when you actually get a look of lo- at low it might be a little off-putting because you've never seen anything like like him first of all you can tell that he's probably an orc but orcs are kind of uncommon especially in absalom and he's a towering hulk of six foot six with greenish skin and black ponytail and an otherwise bald head He's tattooed and scarred all over his body, and one prominent tattoo stands out on his chest, which you see is a crane with a bloody beak and red eyes. And other features that are just, like, you're like, well, if that's not enough, 
you look, you start looking up and down. You notice that his feet below the knees end in cloven hooves. Wait, what? And, and he, yes, cloven hooves with no shoes, and he appears to be something of a tail uh, under his cloak that he's wearing. And in addition, he often, you know, he has loose sitting clothing, and you can see that there might be something that looks like possibly vestigial wings on his back. Very, very unusual. And he yeah. just sort of, he just sort of sits there and nods. Chris Beamer is playing Lo Mang, an orc tiefling monk of the crane style. Orcs aren't normally uh, winged like <laughs> or cloven hooved. Yeah, yeah. I, I was expecting an additional set of arms, actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wish. If that was enough. <laughs> Uh, well, I've seen orcs before, not quite like you, but uh, what what is going on with that guy with like feathers coming out of his hat? What, what, what's 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 your name there, friend? Well, I didn't know what was appropriate to wear to something like this. It is a fairly fancy ceremony, so I thought I should get dressed properly. I don't know. They said they'd be giving us uniforms, but in the, until then, you you have to prepare for all sorts of circumstances. Are you wearing very fancy clothes? I I am suitably fancily dre- fancy dressed at the moment. I, I, I'm so. I'm responding to the icon uh, that is a bird. Is is do you look like he a is bird? in fact a bird? Oh, okay. That's so that's also my, name is, <laughs> my name is Basil Basil Blackfeather. It's nice to meet all of you. Wow. Huh. Well, good to meet you too. And I'll tell you, there's nothing fancier than the dress uniform. You're going to be seeing a lot of it today. A lot of it tomorrow, and a lot of it. The day after that, when do they issue our uniforms? Well, I assume I assume we're dressed in our yeah. Uniform. Are we in them already? Yeah, I do they, do they have a do they have a tailor on call to to make sure the measurements fit? <laughs> yeah, we have an odd group. I'd hate to think we're going out on, on patrol in ill fitting garments. Jason McDonald is playing Basil Blackfeather, a Tengu empiricist investigator. The uniforms you're wearing are more like training uniforms because they wanted to wait for you to actually graduate and for the lawbreaker badges to actually accept you because you have a feeling there's something else going on with that magic and then they'll waste their time and money giving you actual uniforms that fit you especially when you have you know Lo Mang who is like hooven foot with a tail six foot six and and you got Basil Blackfeather you got a whole bunch of different looking people here so you got a lot of tailoring going on for these custom uniforms yeah and I want to I want a loose fitting on uh, Dougie because all of his clothes they're really tight around the center like like the chest and stomach area like the thighs area like it's just it's it's he needs to I don't know add some more material so it's not so tight. So is Dougie a little rotund? He's is a he, little is, yeah, he's a little rotund. He, he, a little he's, bit. He's a little he's uh, barrel he's a, shaped. He's he's a little barrel shaped. You could say he's barrel shaped, but uh, it's 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 all uh, it's all strong. He's actually very strong though. Really? Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, uh, my parents across the uh, the water. Um, they sent me here, and the only thing Dougie has ever wanted to be is a cadet. And there's honestly, if we've got a badge and and, some, and a cadet uniform, that should be enough to command all the respect we're going to need in this city. So he doesn't see a problem with waiting for new you, uniforms at you, all. Are you from around here? Uh, no, no, I am from Taldor, which is right around the way. Uh, it's across the pond a little bit. And, I would expect uh, it's going to take more than the badge to command respect. Not in this city. No, they've got. Uh, if you if you've read the cadet annuals, yes, the wow. law law is the, the 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 law is the law of the land here. I hope you're right. And go, your name is Gomez. That's correct. Like if, if you imagine a combination of uh, Gomez Adams from the comic strip, from the original Charles Adams comic strip, that character. Combined with the uh, the Gestapo guy from from the first Indiana Jones film, combined with uh, Perry the platypus, if you could merge those guys, <laughs> it's the one guy that that's what he looks like. And you look a little bit gobliny, very gobliny, very gobliny, very gobliny. That's quite the combination. Hey, well, it's, I, like, I, it's I, like it's like Perry the platypus's character, but uh, much more the, the look of uh, Gomez Adams and the Gestapo guy merged up. So he looks a little menacing, but. He's actually a sweetheart. 
I, I, I say I say something in Orcish. Um, just say, um, does anyone understand my native tongue? That's a good question. I don't know if I do. Because uh, it could be useful. No. Yeah. No. Nope. No? <laughs> no. How about you, Basil? No, sorry. I'm looking just because... Yeah, I'm... I'm looking for my language. Yeah, does anybody speak Draconic or Gobelin? No. I barely speak Orc. Oh, I actually do have to modify because I have to because I have a, an additional language is Ursiriani, which I should change. I did not take Orc, which is oh well. Who knew? What's like it, what's like the what's like the the is there a native language to Absalom? Common, right? Like, is it common or like is there some like local slang language or anything like that? Seth Lipton is playing Gomez, a goblin elementalist sorcerer. I mean, there's a million languages, but common everyone. Common is the language. So, so yes. Yeah, so all together, we have a male human. We have a male orc thief monster tiefling. Orc tiefling. We have a male tengu and a goblin. This is quite the mix. Red Squad is going to get into a whole bunch of shenanigans. I have a feeling. Red Squad is leap. But we have badges, so we should be fine. We should be mm -hmm. fine. So as you can see, everyone is gathering to squads. And as you know, there are barracks here. You've all been staying in barracks. And it looks like you are given, sure enough, uniforms that will fit to you, as well as some general supplies and an assignment. And it looks like you are given barracks either, well, if any of you are married... <laughs> and have kids and families you can live with them and don't have to live here but you are given free room and board while you are members of edge watch i like that so as well as free food well i know dougie likes that that'll be good that will be very good you got free lodging oh yeah this will be do great. they have a gym yeah actually right, they good. do good sauna sauna steamer yeah i mean this is actually uh, a pretty well decked out guardhouse i mean it's made to house hundreds of guards. It has barracks. It has jail cells. It has offices. I mean, you know, this this is pretty well stocked. And the good thing is that this was here before the Precipice Quarter fell. And this was probably one of the top ranking, you know, guardhouses in the area that probably wouldn't normally go to someone like yourselves. But... There's no one here anymore, so they just took the best uh, the best place for themselves and called it home. So, so you get the reward of being first on premises. So, how long ago was the earthquake? Twenty two years ago. That's before I was born. All right, and, and most of the population has left this Did quarter. That... Yeah, I mean this quarter, okay. like as you know, Absalon is divided up into different areas it's a enormous city biggest city in the world that you know of and this area well pretty much was abandoned because it was taken over by uh, you know undead and other unsavory things so no one really wanted to live here and there was no guards here to keep you know keep all the, the buildings were knocked down like it was all yeah. messed up right? yeah it was yeah. just totally messed up so they thought this is a perfect opportunity to rebuild it let's put the uh, fair here they get a chance to rebuild it. They bring in merchants, you know, they bring in coin and, you know, everything you need yeah. to rebuild the area. Excellent. I'm ready for, I'm ready for my assignment. I'm eager. Yeah, I know. No kidding. Let's put and this you, you note, you note that the only weapon that you see on him is he's got a crossbow and a dagger and that's it. Wow. That's a lot of weapons. And no armor. You have two weapons. I have two uh, weapons. Dougie has no armor and he has no weapons. But that's actually true for Gomez as well. Wow. Yeah, you have two weapons. You should at least spread the wealth a little. Well, the, the dagger is just for, like, cutting ropes. And stuff oh, like I would love to have a dagger. My goodness. Jeez. They sell them at the um, gift shop. Yeah, well, I guess if you have to buy your dagger, then that would be a place to go. <laughs> oh, you mean you should get one issued? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh you you, you you earn your dagger. That's ah. what I'm saying. You earn your dagger. Interesting. A, a, a true cadet, a true cadet will he will adapt to the environment that he is assigned. And if you go walking around with your fancy crossbow, geez, you're gonna stick out like a sore thumb. 
people aren't going to trust you that way. So yeah, yeah, the the, the crossbow is going to be the thing that's going to make him stick out. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I look like a I, I look like a monster. <laughs> My charisma is eight, by the way. Uh, yes, that is <laughs> Dougie's charisma as well, and he uh, lost. I actually took what do they call it? A uh, not a deficiency. I took that too. I I didn't, I, but I didn't take it to raise other scores. Oh really? <laughs> So wait, you are armed with what? You have no no weapon at all? No. Really? In fact, yeah. I don't think any of you are really carrying weapons that we think about. Oh, well, oh, well, well go, go, Gomez. Oh, Meg's walking around with two weapons for crying well, go, Gomez, Gomez says, it's like, well, for me, it's not really necessary. And he smiles. And when he smiles, he reveals these like sharp, shark-like, really serious fangs that his entire mouth is like, it, it's, ah, it's, nice. like it's, it's like a bear trap. And so like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need it. I Who needs claw claw when you have a bite? Nah. Basil has well, he's got a he's got a sap and a sling, and he does have a fairly sturdy walking stick. And wow. armor, no armor, no armor. Oh, padded armor. So he's got a little bit of a very fan, a very fancy, luggage. very fancy, somewhat fancy. Yes. Jeez. So there's an air of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not re- not too far removed from money on him. And Lo Mang, you have no armor as well. No armor. <laughs> oh, but we do have our badge, so we are behind the shield of justice. And we have our yes. You our don't uni- need armor. Our uniform. We have the shield of justice. So what's this? No armor, almost no weapons, and lots of crazy. You don't even have charisma. Like, oh boy, this might. Be I, very... I have a lot of charisma. Oh, I, you I, do. Okay. Like, yeah. yeah, like, like my, like my force of personality is like making this little three foot nothing guy seem like, like, like he's on par with Giganto over here. Yes, I don't. Have a right. lot of, I don't have a lot of book learning either. Just so you know. Oh, Dougie has lots of book learning. Oh, he's got lots of. He carries books with him. Does he really? Oh yes. Oh yes. All right. So after after you get all your equipment, you put on your uniforms, you have your badge, which which strangely makes you feel not only does it make you feel, you know, like a member of the the guard, but it actually makes you feel a little warm inside, as if it's almost a little guardian angel looking over you. Oh, inside and outside. It makes me <laughs> feel great. Are you kidding me? And with that, you are uh, you're called in and you can hear it across the yard. As Lieutenant Lavares screams out, "Red Squad, sir, yes, sir, reporting for duty, running out." Oh, he's over here. So yeah, so we fall in. He's, he's up here near the, through the yes. south. Yes. Where's he? Oh, he's at. Oh, down there. Okay, all right. Dougie McDougal, get over here. Yes, Where are sir, you going? Sorry, sir. The lieutenant rises from the desk, glaring out from beneath brooding brows as he silently studies his new agents. After a long moment, he shakes his head, muttering, Unbelievable! As he pulls out a well chew cigar from his <laughs> mouth and gestures disdainfully, This year's Radiant Festival is the most ambitious peacetime undertaking the city's ever seen! The Edge Watch is responsible for the safety of thousands! I told the council I needed the best of the best, and instead, they sent me you, a bunch of rookies so green you practically got gills. Did you pin those badges on yourself, or did Sergeant Alo have to do it for you? He signs and sits. Abadar only knows what sin I committed to deserve you, but we will work with what we are given. You do what you're told. Learn from the veterans, and maybe, just maybe, you'll come out of this as proper guards. But if I catch you shirking your work or tarnishing the reputation of this precinct, I'll bounce you out of here so hard you'll land in Absalon Harbor. Do I make myself clear? Sir, yes, sir. He yes, doesn't even sir. Wait for, he doesn't even wait for an answer. Instead, he starts snatching up scraps of papers from his desk, holding it out. Here's your first assignment. A bunch of dung-heeled wannabe adventurers are smashing up the tipsy Tengu. Clean it up. Book them or find them. Just don't kill anyone, okay? He shuffles through some more papers on his desk before looking up pointedly 
Well, you want me to hold your hand on the way there? Get going, dismissed. No, yes, sir. sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, by the way, Dougie, throughout his entire speech, is answering. He's answering every rhetorical question. Just, just so you know, like, you know, did, did you pin it on yourself? Do you want me to hold your hand? He's actually answering that while the <laughs> he's stopped. like, no, yeah, don't, you yeah, don't have to hold me. Yeah, you you quickly get out of the way as the next squad gets called in. Blue squad, and sure enough, the same procedure repeats over and over again. And you can overhear that. He's pretty much saying the same thing to everyone. So maybe you don't take it personally. Yeah, don't take it too personally. Or take it personally. It's up to you, however you want to see it. But it seems like he's uh he's not thrilled that he got all green recruits and no experienced members from the rest of Absalom. I'm more concerned about his anger issues. He's he knows he's dealing with recruits. I'm not sure why he'd be so upset. Yeah, I know. This is our first time, sir. I don't I don't understand why 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 you're yelling. He's too but busy. He's busy. We do have I wasn't gonna say that yeah, to yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> uh all right, so we have something to prove to this guy. Um, yes. this guy doesn't like us, so I say we can win him. Like this guy can be our advocate if we could just prove ourselves to be really good uh, cadets. Uh, do I yeah. know do I know where the do I do, like to do, can I do like a society check or whatever to know where this bar is? Do I know where this bar is? Practically live there on your off days. Make sure those badges are like prominently the establishment I'd ever get. Yeah, Doug, Doug is making sure his badge is prominently displayed, like it's almost up to his neck. <laughs> yeah, you actually know exactly where this is. All the information you need is on your papers. This is actually a pretty well-run watch so far, from what you can tell. And everything you need to know is actually on the papers. And from what you can tell is that it's a mid-tier tavern. It's built to cater to foreign officials and dignitaries during the daylight hours. And it opens the doors to more common visitors in the evening. This is all in the report. It's called the Tipsy Tengu. Its owner is an Absalonium named Blueberry Beckenridge, a female halfling. And you can tell that uh, like the other people that managed to stick it out here, there weren't a lot of people who stuck it out here, but a couple of them that did were, oh, taverns, bars, inns, things like that, because there were workers here once in a while. And of course, there are adventurers who would come through this district to prove their worth by, you know, hunting down undead monstrosities and other things. So not everything here was newly built. Some things did survive. It's sort of think of it like downtown in a uh, financial district. It's like during the day, it's kind of busy, but at night, ghost town. No one actually lives there. So that's kind of what Mm -hmm. the Precipice District was like. But obviously in the last few months where all the construction's going on this place has exploded so everyone's yeah. rushing into uh get a i'm sure like every bar and inn and hotel everything's filled it's oh like- yeah yeah everything's doing great so and yeah you know exactly where it is so you can easily head on over can i can i roll society to know if i of happen course. to know the owner Society of 13. Now, normally I would roll it for you since secret check oh, okay. you do. it's okay um yeah you don't know this person personally so, but you've heard of this place. It's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's got I a say, cool name. So I hear these adventurers can be quite a handful. Well, let's go. They like to start a lot of trouble. That's All right. I, oh, there's, okay. So we are actually in the uh, foyer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Are we in there now? Yeah. Do we see what's going on? Yes. You see so the interior see? of the Tipsy Tengu is a raucous mess of tipped over chairs and spilled drinks. A motley crew of drunken adventurers is the clear cause of the chaos, including a dwarven bruiser wearing a horned helmet, a sloppy elf in robes, an armored human worshiper of Caden Kaelin, and a leather-clad halfling. Halfling? <laughs> halfling. All right. I, I, I would like to immediately use okay. intimidation to demoralize the broom by announcing our presence. Edge watch. <laughs> Cut this out right now! <laughs> wow. Okay. You didn't even uh, let me. Uh... Okay. So as soon as you walk in, you try to announce your presence. Right. You can. You can do that. Check. Do do do. Gives intimidation. Twenty six. Twenty six. Well, you definitely get the room's attention, 
and they all like do the record skip and look over to you and some of the more drunkard ones start going back to what they were doing and it's not quite as raucous as when you first walked in but it's definitely a little bit uh it's definitely a little bit less raucous but it's still pretty raucous oh you know what i do actually i do the uh john cleese as a bobby what's all this then (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well before you can do all of that and everyone's looking around right in front of you actually right in front of you gomez uh-huh. a well-dressed man with an ornate cane and bold blue eyes leaps to his feet where he was seated next to the door and he says ah and he seems very impressed with you the city's finest come to deliver us from churls and belligerents he lowers his voice and adds only to Gomez to hear. Honestly, I never allowed their sort into my hotel, but poor Blairberry thought they'd add some flavor, and they certainly have. He sticks out his hand to shake. Hello, good sir of the watch. I am Hendred Patrick, proprietor of the Dreaming Palace. This, and he sort of gestures over, is my associate Roslo. And you see a hard-looking half-orc woman. He goes on to explain to you, it's like, You know, we thought we'd come here and enjoy a quiet night of dinner and drinks before the opening day festivities tomorrow. But so much for rest and relaxation, though, eh? A cup suddenly smashes the man in the face as one of the adventurers howls with laughter. He clutches his bleeding nose and steps aside. Well then, I'll let you be about it. Good day, sir. Good day, sirs of the watch. And he briskly leaves the establishment with Roslo in tow. All right, so I want to do, like, just, just, I want to know whether or not I got to stop these guys. So I'd like to do a uh, legal lore check to go to search through my training. That do, do I want a potential witness to just be walking out like this? Or do I have the authority and that it is appropriate for me to stop them and say, excuse me, sir, sir, will you sit down? We might need to take your statement. This is like a bar brawl. This is nothing. Um, do we have a sense of who threw the cup? Uh, yeah, you actually do have a sense. You uh, believe it is the dwarf barbarian threw the cup. Ah, of course. Is that Bowler? Bolar, yes, you see Bolar. Bolar Stone, uh, Stonemore. All right, lacking any sort of uh, larger practical sense of wisdom, uh, Basil is going to go walk up to him. So sure enough, you can see that after taking a look at the place, you realize that there's only really four people really causing trouble. It looks like that female elf is just just blind drunk crying and going on and on about something Bolar, uh mural greyleaf uh, oh, okay you, you see bolar stone more is a male dwarf barbarian he, he just looks like he's he's itching for a fight and he's just going crazy like throwing things and he's daring everyone to fight him you have the uh male human who is obviously a cleric of Caden Kaelin and is just worshiping Caden by getting stinking drunk. <laughs> and then finally, you which, have, guy, which guy is that? Who's that? Uh, Ontario Bloodblade. Okay. And finally, you have Skebs. It's an agender halfling. And you see Skebs appearing to try to pick the pocket of a drunkard. This is all happening simultaneously. There's a lot going <laughs> on right now. So, all right, Dougie's reaction is going to be stop right there, mister, to Skebs. All right, we'll do each one in order. So first... Yeah, it's hard to do anything. Yeah, we're going to do everything. There's so much like, going on, and it's just yeah. like, you really want to run it. How do you want to run it? How do you run it? I'm going to run it one at a time. So first we'll go to Basil, Blackfeather. So Basil goes up to Bolar, and Bolar looks at you. And although he's a male dwarf, he has a huge battle axe, and he's wearing studded leather armor. And he looks at you, and he's like, Oh, bird boy, you wish to pick a fight? You think you're better than me? I wouldn't say that, sir, but this is a, you know, this is a polite establishment, and people are trying to enjoy themselves, and you really shouldn't be throwing cups at people. I think you need to settle down. 
Oh, <laughs> really now? Ooh, I'm so scared of Mr. Bird Person. Ah, uh, cups, cups. And with that, he takes a plate of food and throws it across the room. It's like, how about that? How about a plate? Is that better for you? I really didn't want... We didn't really want to have to do this, but uh, you're going to have to come with us, sir. <laughs> oh, am I? Ooh, who are you? Some fancy bird person. Some tin star on your chest. Doesn't mean anything to me. And let's go to Dougie. Dougie, you see Skebs uh, attempting to pickpocket the drunkard, but then drunkard suddenly like starts patting him away. He's like, bro, what are you doing? What are you doing? And Skebs just like takes his hand away. He says, nothing, nothing. I'm just practicing. I wasn't going to take anything. I promise. I would have given it back. I'm just practicing. Uh, Skebs is female or male? Agender. Okay. Uh, Skebs, your pickpocketing days are over. You're not, you don't need to be practicing because you're not going to pickpocket anymore. Do you understand me? Mmm, I have no idea what you're talking about, sir. So, would, do you wish to try to intimidate or use diplomacy with this, uh... Oh, definitely diplomacy. There's no <laughs> reason to intimidate. He looks Dougie <laughs> up and down. After that, he goes... How about this? You look like an upstanding citizen of the world. I can tell right a man. You're a man of class. A man who knows one thing or another. How about I practice on you? And don't worry. You'll know all along. Just tell me if you feel me or not. I just want to practice my pickpocketing. Don't worry. I'm not going to take anything. Here. And he just like, he takes like an apple. He goes, let's take this apple and put it in your pocket. I'm just going to try to get the apple. See, it's not even yours. It's just, it's just some food. I just want to practice. That's all I want to do. How's that? Is that sound okay? Practicing is, you're practicing for the wrong road. You're, 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 you're just going down the wrong path with this, this, this practicing. You, you, you want to practice uh, getting a job and, and, and cleaning up like your hair is all over the place. You should, you, you do, you don't go looking for work like that. I mean, come on. Looking for work? I'm an adventurer. Work comes to find me. No, no, it's part of my job description. Pickpocketing? You know, if you were an adventurer, you would know that. I need to go out and pick a pocket or two. It's part of the job description. No, 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 because I will stop you from that. That, that. I have to protect the citizenry from your pickpocketing ways. Fine, I won't pickpocket. You are no fun. All right, let's go to Gomez. What's Gomez going to do? I've taken out my uh, paper and pen, and I'm taking notes. Uh, I'm, I'm noting Skeb's attempted, uh, attempted theft, uh, specifically in parentheses pickpocketing. Uh, Bolar, Stone, more uh, attempted the assault of, a, of an officer of the watch, uh, drunk and disorderly. Uh, I, I'm keeping my eye on Ontario Boldblade. It's like drunk question mark disorderly question mark, and I'm thinking about it. And what's the and what's the other guy we're worried about? The other NPC, the other adventurer we're worried. There was Muriel, but she was just like upset. She was oh, it's a, a very very drunk elf. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, and it's like, and like again, drunk question mark, disorderly question mark, and uh, I'm just like I'm recording, I'm recording the entire event, uh, the, the entire situation for uh, information later. Lomang, what does All Lomang right. do? I go over here, and I, and then underneath my uniform, I pull out a holy symbol for Cadis uh, Caden, and say, "Look, I understand." But do you have any control over your friends here? Because they're 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 close to spending a night in jail. So you, you're right. talking to Ontario Blood. Blood. Yeah, the, the the actual priest of right, uh, the priest of right, Caden. right, and I, and I'm a worshiper. Oh, fellow Caden Kalinian, come on, sir, let's celebrate this night before the festival. I here, understand, have a, have a but drink. I'm. No, oh, I'm on duty. Our God, God, God demands that we drink in I his name. I understand, but I'm on duty right now, and Aww. there's a time and a place, and you need to get your friends Aww. under control, or they're all going to spend a night in the drunk tank. Oh, <laughs> but you know, we just had a really bad adventure. We're just, 
just blown off steam. We went to go hunt some things, and you know, it didn't go well, and now everyone's upset. Did you? The first rule, though, did you make it back alive? Yes, so you can be happy with that. Kinda. <laughs> poor, poor Gray Leaf, a raven. Runkles the raven. Her familiar died. It was it was eaten by an alligator. Mm. She, she's she's look at her, and you look over. She's crying. She's like totally crying, sobbing, screaming. She's just saying, "Runkles, Runkles." It, it's just a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we'd have crocodile problems in this uh, city. Yep. So look, you got to gotta get let's get them under control here. I don't I want this to end peacefully. I don't want anyone to have to spend a night in lockup. Of course I have no diplomacy skills and no no, no intimidate nothing. I'm just trying to appeal to the fact that we worship the same God. Yeah, that'll hmm. do it. So diplomacy Wow, yeah, you you are you are the opposite <laughs> of a skill monkey. Yep. <laughs> you are a punch monkey instead. I'm good at certain things. What I'm really good at, I'm really good at. She, she's just so drunk that all she wants to do is just, she's like trying to offer you beer and alcohol. And she's like, come on, come on. We got, we got to celebrate. It's like, Mario, Grayley, get over here. This guy's going to celebrate with us. You can drown your sorrows. He wants to hear about the Raven. And she's like crying. She comes over to you. And even though you're this huge man, and she just like she just wanders over and just like collapses on your chest, low mag, and she's just like crying and crying. She's like, "My raven, my raven, he's dead. Rockles is dead." Do you, do you think a bird dead. person coming over and talking to her would make things better or worse? Right? <laughs> well, wait, you, you, you're a raven familiar. If I know something about that, you can make another one in a week. Oh, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's Ruckles. I don't want Ruckles too. I want Ruckles. <laughs> Ruckles, he's dead. He's eaten. A terrible death. The crocodile just ate him. <laughs> oh, look, you're causing a major disturbance, and and your friend Bolar is very close to going to jail. So you want to think about this. Let's get this under control. I think you need need to go to your rooms and sleep it off. And with that, um, Ontario Bloodblade, she pukes all over you. Projectile <laughs> <laughs> vomits all over your chest. Your tattoo is covered in puke. And she I... says to you, and she goes, To Kaden! I look over to Gomez from across the room, and I, mm-hmm. and I mouth the words in, if you can read lips, I, I mouth the words, Does that constitute assault? <laughs> like the word assault? I, I, I shake my head, probably not. And uh, and I, I go over and I, I go to and I, I go to the bar and I want to talk to uh, uh, Bellberry Breckenridge, the, the the owner, the the staff. Sure, we'll get to Bolar in a second because Bolar is about to uh, get kind of nasty. Everyone else is just well. As of right now, Skebs seems to be under control. He's not. On the right path. He's on That's... the right path. Bloodblade just puked all over Low Man mm. and got a whole bunch of it into Greyleaf's hair because she was hugging oh, her chest. Oh, man. While this was happening, she does not seem to care. She's just so inconsolable crying. She's just like, she doesn't even notice it. And Bolar is like staring Basil down and ready to throw down. <laughs> Gomez, what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, I, I like I get Lomang's uh, attention and I point to Bolar, but then I go to uh, uh, Bellberry Breckenridge and I say we had a call of uh, we got, it's like we had a call of a riot here, but it looks like this is just his normal Saturday night. Like wh- what's going on? I'd like to take your statement. Like why were we called here? She looks at you and she's like, "Oh, thank the Lord you're here. Please help. I usually only have my doors open to." elite clientele and i thought in because of the festival that i would let commoners and adventurers and others in here but as you can see i'm way over my head here i didn't expect this level of shenanigans i thought you know maybe they would come in they would tell some tales of adventure we'd hear all about how they went and saved the kingdom or did something heroic and you hear all these amazing stories but 
I guess they don't talk about this in the brochures. I think adventurers were more likely to do this than to actually, I don't know, bring in customers. They seem to be driving them away. Please, please help me. I, I got to change my clientele. I did not expect this at all. Okay, I want to like I want to use my society and kind of sum up the situation because uh, so uh, so so like, th- this establishment what is this is like an upper class establishment that they would with that they wouldn't have bouncers I mean it's like we're 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 in a weird part of town that's got a lot of bad history and uh, she doesn't have a bouncer in a bar and she's letting adventurers in what what's going on I'm trying um, to answer. yeah well basically she always had foreign officials and dignitaries that comes to this establishment. Quite frankly, no. <laughs> she usually was only open during the daylight hours and she does have an inn as well as a common room, a bar, a kitchen, a stable, and an upstairs with a bedroom, which she would only lend out to the highest clientele. So she usually knew the people that were staying with her. So opening it up to adventurers and more commoners, this is new because although this is a you know dilapidated area, people would come here to sort of look around. Sometimes you would have very high level adventurers come. You know, think of it this way. You would have the mid-tier people come to this establishment, not the low tier. Right, right. Uh, okay. So uh, do, do I know off the top of my head a, uh, another bar in this vicinity that is, that, that, that's, a, that's a better match for this type of clientele? Oh, you can think of 10 bars off the top of your okay. head. That's a better match for this type of clientele. All right. So, uh, and who looks to be, okay, so we got two drunks, we got, we got a thief, and we got Bolar is the one that seems to be the, the, the one that's causing the most trouble, right? Well, they're all causing trouble in different ways, depends how you depict nah, like, like <laughs> uh, Yeah, like, yeah, like, like he's, he's, okay, see, so does Bolar, you know, like, can, is there, like, a way I can get a sense as to who the leader of this party is? Because they're all part of one group, right? Yeah, in fact, here's the weirdest part, you keep hearing them change their names, one point you hear them call themselves the Splendid Spelunkers, but then another person's like, "No, we're the Burning Banshees," okay, and they're just they're, they're, ar- they're arguing over the name of their group. I so like you that. don't know if they're the Splendid Spelunkers or Burning Banshees. It's okay. one or the other. All right, but but from that interchange, can I get a feel for who the like who the party leader is? Um, who's the no. caller? Who's you the caller no of this party? Oh, you have yeah. no idea. All right, That's That's probably cut. it's probably the cleric. Who is now covered in vomit? Got it. Oh, all right. Wow. So uh, I, I'm like right next to Bolar, so I would like to address Bolar, and I would like to use diplomacy, and I would like to explain to Bolar. Bolar is like it's like Bolar. Bolar is it? And this is a, this is we got called on here. It's like I, I have an I have I have an attempted uh, uh, pickpocketing over here. You threw a uh, you threw something at a at a at a, at a uh, guard of the watch. But we're, I'm not inclined to make trouble here. Like, like I, I think the problem is that this just isn't, isn't a good match. Have you been to? And I start and I name uh, the closest place that is more appropriate for this type of uh, for the for this type of customer. It's in the puddles. Yeah. Tell them yeah. to go to the puddles. Well, I, well, that's in a completely different part of <laughs> yes. town. I want I want to, I want them to go someplace like across the street. Like, like yeah. what's the closest yeah. place? If they went yeah. to the puddles. It would solve sure. our problem. Yeah, they're not going there. Yeah. Uh, ba- he's about to throw down on Basil. And instead, right as he's about to throw his punch, he looks over to you, Gomez. He hears that, and he says, You're challenging me to a duel? Is that what you just said? No, you I'm challenging you. one on one. That's right. Let's go. No, no Let's I'm not challenging go. Yeah. I'm, not cha- I'm challenging you to free yeah. drink. Free I'm challenging drink. you right. to free Whoever drink. Whoever wins buys right. drinks for the other person. All Fair right. Well, we got we, we got to go someplace with some like, decent food. No, booze, right man. here. Come on. He's ready to go. You and me. Let's go. This Not place. This place's off. boobs sucks. We got to go to this other place. This oh, place. Got to got news, go. And I have it in on the thing. Oh, so it's like, are you too are you too afraid of me to drink a man's drink? You're gonna drink this full piss water that I have here. That's not that's not that, that's not suitable for an adventure such as you. Now, adventure. come to me to a place. They got man's drink. I'll drink you under the table. Let's go. Drink me under the table, huh? Yeah. Or maybe you're afraid of a little a little guy like me. Maybe you think you can't handle vegetarian drinking. Maybe maybe a, maybe the reputation of the guards of the watch and their capacity for ale has intimidated you. No, I, I think maybe Nothing not. Nothing intimidates me. 
Not all right. Well, then, all right. Well, then, well, then let's go. I'll show you a place. I'll show you a place for a real man does it gets a real drink, and I'll show you and I'll show you what what a real man drinks and how a real man drinks. Come on. Uh, unless you, like unless you're unless you're too afraid to to try to out drink a goblin, and I, and I like and I and I, I like I I, uh, tr- I start trying to walk him to the door. I start trying or not walk him to the door, but I try to try to, to encourage him using that diplomacy angle to convince him to leave the establishment. Okay, he 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 looks around and he says, "This place stinks anyhow." Splendid spelunkers, and then you hear half of them mumble, "Burning banshees," and he's like, "Splendid spelunkers, let's go." This place stinks. It smells like puke. It does. And the pickpocketing is terrible. Let's get out of here. We'll go across the street and show this little guy what it's like to really drink. All right, so I want to leave the establishment and and hopefully get these guys in tow. And I, and I signal and I signal to my friends like, help them along. Like, yep, don't, yeah. but like like walk next to them as they're leaving. Please. Yeah, Dougie is watching their every step, every right, single too. step. Your 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 manchie spelunkers are leaving here, so let's go. Yeah, Antonio looks a little unsteady. Give him a hand. Let's go. <laughs> Antonio is in really really bad shape, and he he's just being you know he, he just needs totally to be picked up and moved. Meanwhile, Greyleaf won't stop holding on to Lomang and won't stop crying. All right, I do this. I put one of each of them over my shoulders and I walk them out. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're out of here. And they just like, you like, okay, you just sort of take them out of there. Yes. Take them outside. Oh, you are covered in puke now. I'm already covered in puke. What am I going to do? It's nasty. I'm uh, very do, upset do you about take that. a charisma hit for that puke? Yeah, the charisma went to your charisma into that down, down negative fix. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Maybe even a four. Yeah, Dougie's going to be walking in front of all that. That's, That's right. Be, I'm going to work. I've seen front. lots worse. Oh, yeah, he's, he's got a natural puke set already, Yeah, I've so. seen a lot worse than this. Believe me. So, so you go outside, and before you can even get across the street... Your, your lawbreaker badges. You, you think you can hear it telepathically uh-huh. in your mind. You can't tell if it's being telepathic or it's actually saying it. But you can uh-huh. actually hear pretty much the same list that Gomez was doing. And you can repeat it to them directly, which is disturbing the peace, you know, uh, you know, minor assault, destruction of police property, of like puking on it. Nothing major. Right, Roger. so we got we should we should find him because we don't want to just move him to yeah, another no, no. place. It's, it's a minor home. thing. And yeah, you, I, I just want to I just want to get him out of there. So if it's a fight, yeah. it's not a fight in the bar. And yeah, so we yeah. get him. So we get him on the street, and now we should we should we should do we should do our duty. Yeah, and you and you hear the fine in your head is uh, eight gold pieces each is the fine for um, what they caused in terms of damage to the bar and disturbing the bar, disturbing the peace, and also just and also just uh, general destruction of, uh, oh, I don't know, your uniform, because you're going to need a new right. one. Yes, today. by the power vested in us and the Lawbringer badge is on yes. the, and, the, and the authority of Absalon Edgewatch, right. you are now fined eight gold pieces each. Right. right. Eight Table is, now. It's right. not a and, and I give them, and, and, like, and, and this, this is the way I'll play it, is uh, intimidation, uh, you got a choice. All right, so you got. We could do this the easy way. We could do this hard way. The easy way is you pay the fine for the for the for the this charge, that charge, that charge. And we let you go. You go to the other bar and you enjoy the rest of your night. The hard way is you start a fight and then it's discharge, discharge, discharge plus assault, plus assault of a, of the watch, and your night ends here and you're spending the next week in jail. So you take you, you decide right now. You pay in the fine now and you jo- go enjoy the rest of your night, or we lay down a roll initiative. What it's going to be. They, they, they suddenly seem to get a little bit more sober and they look at you and they're like, you know, we were just having fun. We just had a, we just had a real bad night adventure. And that's, and that's why we're not bringing you in. And that's why we're going to let you go. If you play the fine. Right. Eight gold each. It's not a lot. We're not taking a bite out of crime. It's a nibble out of crime. 
Fine, fine. And with that, you also have to write, you know, the little receipt. You have to write them up. Yep. You have your little pad in front of you, so you write this all up. And you can tell that the Lawbreaker badge is basically, you know, doing this all and sort of helping you along. Like, you, right. even if you don't know it, you can tell that the Lawbreaker badge was very quietly, secretly right. witnessing this whole thing, recording it, and telling you what was needed to get done. Okay, so, and, and, wh- and while it's like now that they've calmed down and they're actually paying up, I give them a little Yelp reviews of all of the other abars that they can that they could behave like this, and it's just normal behavior and enjoy yourselves, and that, like to, to give them options. That's not going to uh, the good places like this anymore. They, they 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 seem to understand, and they were like, "There's a place called Roadhouse. It's got sawdust <laughs> on the floor." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, Roadhouse. And you wow. see, we'll be nice. Wow. We'll be nice until it's time not to be nice. Right. <laughs> so they, 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 they understand. They're like, I'm sorry. We, they even seem a little apologetic. It's like we weren't, we weren't trying to cause trouble. And they see, like, a, sure enough, across the street at the Roadhouse Bar, there's, like, literally fights breaking out, and no one seems to care. And the, and the, the barbarian's like, that's my type of place. There Come you go. on, crew. Let's go on over there. Splendid spelunkers, and you hear the other drunkards one go burning banshees. They're like, let's go, and they pay the All fine, right. take the receipts, nice. and walk on over. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Stay safe. Yeah. They know it's legit when there's sawdust on the floor. Yeah, does the other tavern does the other ta- tavern have an old Woody on tap sign in the window? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> old Woody. Oh. It's, it's old Woody. Old Woody light. Old Woody draft. Old Woody Winter Ale, Old Woody Summer Ale. It's Old, old Woody Lime. Uh, the young old, old Woody Ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Old Woody Clear. It's uh oh, it's Crystal Woody. There we go. It's it's the whole gamut of Woodies is uh is across the street. In fact, I guarantee it's a quality, it's a quality establishment. I right there. guarantee you're gonna be seeing a lot of old woody and a lot of varieties of old woody you're gonna see old woody's brother mother sister every family member of the old woody it is a three-month party that's right there's gonna be there's gonna be new drinks that we can invent that have never even been thought of for this adventure i can't wait so I'm a mess, covered in vomit. I'm like, ugh, it's like this is this is this is horrific. Pre- like, press the digitation, I fixed that. Oh, you're the best, oh, I like you already. Nice, nice. So it's the protocol that we go report back to. Uh, yep, yep. You're you're oh, done, yeah. and you um you have your report, and it looks like again you you, you kind of just know this that these lawbreaker badges are pretty cool, like. You know, it's like, yeah, you you obviously have to file reports, but this is definitely going to save in the paperwork is that it's sort of doing all of this for you to make sure, I guess, nothing is missed. And this kind of makes sense. And you're thinking about it, knowing your lore's knowledge is that after, well, what happened with Tarbafon and the city almost getting destroyed and it hasn't been a Radiant Festival in over 200 years, that they really went all out to make sure that not only were the watch on the up and up, but to even watch the watch. Who watches the watch? Well, the lawbreaker badges do. So, yep. you know, um, but you guys definitely, uh, five stars, excellent job. Totally diffused the situation, exemplary. Are we allowed to do the paperwork in case we want that for our personal of records? Of course you get oh, to do Oh, thank goodness. The okay, good. Of course you uh, I'm not so good at the reading. Um, maybe you can help me with my paperwork. I'm not so good at that either, but I just like to have this on my records. So uh, I'll do what I can. I'll make duplicates for you, for everybody. Oh, and, and by the way, after this is all taken care of, um, Beckenridge comes running out. And she says, thank you, thank you so much for helping me out there. I learned my lesson. I'm going to be a little bit more careful with my clientele. I'm going to definitely get a bouncer or two. Thank you so much. And you you four did an amazing job. I'm going to put in a word of your, who, who's in charge? Who, who's your head honcho? Who is it? Uh, it's the uh, corporal, corporal. Lieutenant. Uh, no, oh, Lieutenant Lovarsa. Yeah. Yeah. Really, the badges, the badges did all the work for us. You know, once you walk in with the badge, it's, well, it's well, downhill from there. If you, Just doing our job, ma'am. Uh, well, if you want to come back 
And if you want, if you want to stay here, or if you want some free drinks and food, come on by. Place is open to you. You did such a good job. That was. I was worried that they were going to smash up this place, and it was going to cost me a month of wages. Thank you so, uh, so much. That'd be against regulations, but thank you for the sentiment, man. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, again, again, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm going to make sure that your lieutenant hears about the amazing job you did. I'm going to write him a letter right now. Thank, thank you. you. And be careful. Be safe. And with that, she she runs back into uh, her Tengu. What was it called again? The Tipsy Tengu. Tipsy Tengu. Tipsy Tengu. Tipsy Tengu. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good name. And sure enough, you uh, go back to the headquarters Lieutenant Lavara sees you, and uh, the prestidigitation mostly worked. You know, you kind of still stink a little, I think. Yeah, it's and, and, and he sees you walk in. There's nothing for the smell. And he's like, I heard you actually did a serviceable job. No one killed. You actually managed to do a pretty good job at uh, diffusing the situation. Yeah, that's right. I was secretly watching you the whole time. This was a test. To make sure that you are made of the right stuff. That you don't go in there and start killing people willy-nilly. I know we went through extensive background checks with all of you. I don't trust any of that. I want to make sure that I know that I can trust you. I just trusted in my training, sir. It's true. The training was was excellent. I guess you did a pretty good job. Low man, you go take a shower. And the rest of you, you got the rest of the day off for doing such a good job. So... Rest up, because the festival starts tomorrow. Mm-hmm. All right, good. I will take a shower. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I came within a few seconds of just zapping the guy. With oh, the did you? <laughs> I thought about it. You yeah. Could've. I was going to try to do it while the rest of his party was distracted, so that maybe they wouldn't have noticed. You could have if you wanted. I mean, yeah, the barbarian investigator mismatch. <laughs> well, but then Seth had, I probably picked the wrong encounter to jump in on. I probably <laughs> not. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Oh, I, I probably should have gone to the lady who was upset about her bird if I was thinking about it. That might have been a little more up my alley, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So what did we get out of that? We got we we did get some fines. We got eight gold. Is what oh, we got. Oh, oh, I, sure we don't get all. I don't think we got all of it. Uh, yeah. We'll, see, we'll have to see how that shakes. What what our cut is. I, I gotta say that was that was actually pretty hilarious because the thief of a party getting caught red-handed trying to pickpocket somebody and trying to pass it off as practicing that right. is one hundred percent the like the lame excuse that a player character would use in that situation <laughs> on a guard, and it was really funny to be on the be on the other side of that. There's four GMs and one player right now in this situation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you also can defuse things as you can see. You don't have to fight all the time. We don't have to walk around carrying crossbows like we're some. <laughs> hey, I, I have a crossbow that has blunt arrows, though. Uh, oh, There's yeah. big metal blocks on the head of them. You, you can put an eye out with that. Oh, it's no fun <laughs> it's true. until you put an eye out. All right, so I get cleaned up, rested. I guess we rest, right? Well, you can look around a little, and just so you understand, you get to keep those eight gold pieces so you each have eight gold pieces how it really works is that the fine is higher than what you're collecting but i don't want to turn into math finder where oh well you collected 10 gold but then 20 percent goes to the court and so i'm just gonna abstract it all it's kind of like a commission you get commissioned yeah so you you could so you could just say you all get net eight gold pieces yes right. so we'll just say at the end the fine was actually a little higher but you get a net of eight gold pieces each which you have and now that you have a little bit of cash on you you decide to look around and sure enough there is a dispensary where you can buy pretty much anything that is listed as common in the pathfinder rules is sold here for you as a guard and they actually have an amazing selection of things so if you're enter- ever interested in buying something you can just come back here and pick up what you need it's actually quite nice if you have to buy it that's true that's true yeah i don't think i need anything right now but let's we'll see travel light yeah i travel light i mean i have some stuff i don't even walk around with i do have a 10-foot pole lying around do you guys know the uh, the thing about the hog's tooth that a sniper has? 
No. That is the, a real hog's tooth is a bullet that you take from a, 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 an enemy sniper that you put into them. It is the first uh, shell out of their gun. And that is the thing that you draw. That's actually the only legitimate way that you can act, actually wear a bullet around your neck is that's a real hog's tooth. So you take <laughs> it from the body of a sniper that you took out first. That's the really? only, I never heard that, of that. That's the proper way of, well, sniper versus sniper. Uh, that's a that's the proper way of getting uh, a hog's tooth. And you <laughs> shouldn't have a hog's tooth unless you do it that way. Well, I have a hog's tooth, and I did ah, it a different way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You bought it. We know. Yeah, I bought yeah it. you I bought, bought it. it. Yeah. You, you said, "Oh, look at this thing! I'll just throw this around my head, and they'll call it a hog's tooth." Yeah, exactly. They sell it at the commissary. It's five silver. Yeah. So I'm ready for the festival opening. Okay. So you uh, you check around. This place is nice. You were kind of restricted to walking around because you weren't proper agents before, but now you got the lay of the land. You rest up. Low man gets some new clothes. Yes, thank you. Got most of the smell out, but you're still finding puke in a lot of places you wish there weren't any. Ugh, awful. And uh, you get up, and once again, you are brought to the Edge Watch duty board. Where Sergeant Olo details active investigations and assigns patrol routes and shifts. Though the fair has been gathering steam for months, with many exhibitors setting up early, this is the Radiant Festival's first official day, the first day of summer. And the streets outside Edgewatch headquarters are teeming with people. Inside the precinct, Sergeant Olo stands before the Edge Watch duty board, an oversized map of the precipice quarter, tacked to a large plank of wood facing the headquarters' main floor. He looks at everyone and he starts giving everyone and all the squads there various areas for you to roam around the district to better familiarize yourself with the various neighborhoods and beats. So you can see that each area of the district was given to different squads. And sure enough, you see an area pretty close to the headquarters for Red Squad. You're given your patrol route. And the sergeant looks at you all and says, Here you go, Red Squad. This is your area. So just sort of patrol the area, get a feel for the place, talk to the locals, see that there's no trouble brewing. And then report in at the end of the day. How's that sound? Aye, aye, sir. Yeah, it seems pretty simple. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Yes, the dwarf and sergeant is much, much nicer than the lieutenant, as you can tell. And he seems a a little bit more, uh, well, level-headed and definitely not nearly as loud. So he he sort of nods his head. He says, okay, dismissed. Good luck out there. I make sure my, my crossbow is in working order. I say, look at this crossbow, Dougie. That is... That's what you need, something like that, maybe. Like, what are you going to use if you have to apprehend or go hands-on? What are you going to do? Uh, you just punch him. I, really? I do I do uh, Egg Chen's lightning between the hands maneuver. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. How, Taoist alchemy and sorcery. That's what it is. Six demon bag. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> All right, let's go patrol. Let's go meet these citizens. You've been listening to Roll for Combat, Agents of Edgewatch. If you have a question or comment for the show, please visit us at RollForCombat.com. You can also find us and play various games on our Discord channel at Discord.RollForCombat.com.